Marksmanship in Morrowind gets a bad rap, and it's because of the game's weird dice roll mechanics for accuracy. However, if you build the character right, it's not all that bad. So here's the question. Can you beat the entire main quest by using only marksmanship class weapons in combat? Let's find out. I'm going with a Wood Elf for this challenge because they get an extra plus 15 bonus to marksmanship, which significantly increases your accuracy. This is the equation for accuracy. Simply put, higher number better. Ignore the blind modifier. I'm playing with OpenMW, which is a different engine from Morrowind, is much improved, and it fixes a lot of bugs. Regardless, higher skill, more accuracy is good. Wood Elves also start with 50 agility, contributing further to an easier early game. I'm also picking the weirdest hairstyle because I learned from Dark Souls that you need to make your character look as dumb as possible. That's the rule. So leveling in Morrowind is a bit goofy. This is why I'm making a custom class for this challenge. If you're familiar with Oblivion's leveling system, then you know it benefits you to have useless major skills. It allows you to control the rate at which you level and allows you to maximize the amount of skill ups you can get between each level. Morrowind has major and minor skills. It's a small difference from Oblivion, but the idea is basically the same. In retrospect, some of these choices were bad, but Morrowind isn't as unforgiving as you might think. You can make two. Leveling quirks aside, major skills get a bonus 25 levels and minor skills get a bonus 10. There's a class specialization as well. It grants an additional five levels to all skills within that class specialization. I'm going with stealth for more marksmanship levels and I'm going with the warrior star sign for even more accuracy. It grants plus 10 to attack, which is pretty much a 10% boost to accuracy. We get an extra 10 points to the attributes we designate as our favorite attributes. Agility is a no brainer for accuracy. And because endurance determines how much health you gain per level up, and it's not retroactive, it's worthwhile to have it high early, so we're getting endurance as well. With this setup, I should have around 60% accuracy if I start a fight with no stamina, which is called fatigue, so max fatigue means full stamina. It's weird. This is before factoring in an enemy's evasion chance though. Regardless, anything that skews the dice roll in your favor is a good thing. Now that we're in the game proper, the first thing to do, steal this plate, then quickly drop it. The guard will scold you for stealing, but then you can pick it back up no problem. It's expensive and we'll need the cash. Loot this barrel and grab this ring and give it back to Fargoth. We won't be using the ring, but it can be useful if you're new to the game. Also, we're just going to steal it back in a bit. Sell the plate to the shop in Sedanine, learn about Fargoth's secret hiding spot, wait atop the lighthouse in the middle of the night, then steal his ring and a few hundred gold from this hollowed out log. You're supposed to share it with the guy who told you about it, but screw him. We got stuff to do. We take the silt stride out of Balmora, get used to these fellows. They're noisy, but they're good boys, and pop into the razor hole to buy our first weapon. A long bow with some arrows, and a crossbow with some bolts. Bows do variable damage based on how far you draw the arrow back. The damage range in the tooltip doesn't mean it's randomized as I thought at first. Crossbows, however, do a set amount of damage because there's no variable draw distance. That's why it says it does between 20 and 20 damage. It always does 20 damage. I have no idea how bolts and arrows affect the amount of damage you do. That might be variable. I don't know. All I assume is the more expensive arrows are stronger. <laughs> That's uh, the arrows don't say anything about damage on them. Anyway, bows and crossbows both have their own benefits, so I'm buying one of each and ammunition to go with them. So we were brought to Morrowind from prison for a reason. And to learn more, we can visit our local library, uh, shirtless old man, Caius Cossades. He gives us our first orders, speak with Hasfat Antibolus at the Balmora Fighters Guild and learn what he knows about the Nerevarine cult and the Sixth House cult. Hasfat wants us to go to Arkingthand, a nearby Dwemer ruin, and get a Dwemer puzzle box, which I can only assume summons a bunch of Molag Ball's minions to torture you into ecstasy, but that's not my problem. Crassius is probably more interested in that, but Hasfat wants it. Before doing that though, we have to get two items that will be invaluable during this whole run. They aren't technically mandatory, but they kind of are. I always get these if I'm playing a non-magic character. While I'm on my way out, I join the Fighters Guild just so I can take a bunch of the supplies from their chest. Arrows, health potions, repair hammers, you know. So one of the two items I need will be a bit tough to get. You have to fight some highish level enemies. Higher than level 1 at least, so I need gear. If you have the Tribunal DLC, which you should since I doubt you can even buy Morrowind without it all bundled together anymore, while sleeping or waiting, you have a chance to wake up being attacked by a member of the Dark Brotherhood. He's not super easy to kill, but it's manageable. His gear is pretty decent, and it's light armor, meaning it won't take up too much of my carry weight. I also killed a second one so I can sell his gear for a decent chunk of change. The ebony darts they drop are worth 2k alone. When you sell gear, the merchants immediately put it on. It's really silly. With even more septums on hand, I head over to the Mage's Guild and pay a meager fee to be teleported to Caldera. This is Marwin's version of fast travel, by the way. You can't just click on the map and go. Travel is all in universe. The merchant Varric Jemaine sells us an amulet of recall. When cast, this amulet will return you to the last location you marked. 
What does that mean? Well, that's what the second item is for. I return to Belmora, join the Mages Guild, take the teleport scrolls from their chest, and use the Siltstrider taxi service to head over to the fishing village of Narmok. There's a cave just outside Narmok called Shorinbal, and it's full of enemies over level 10, but levels are just a suggestion. See, accuracy is a two-way street. With high agility, your evasion chance makes the game just as frustrating for the NPCs as it does for you. With archery and acrobatics, you can kind of hop and strafe while turning enemies into pincushions. Don't worry, it gets better, especially when the enemies I fight are closer to my level. After pushing past several enemies, painstakingly poking them with a prodigious amount of paros, until they stop moving, I come to the end of the dungeon where a Dunmer mage awaits. He chases me through the water, since I'd rather not fight two people at the same time, and here is where I learned that bows don't work against submerged enemies. This will be a problem later. Fortunately, mage-based characters never have much health, defense, or dodge chance, and die rather easily, except for when they heal. This guy, Galtis Sarethi, and I'm gonna be honest right now, that's the normalest sounding name you're gonna hear through this whole entire video. Anyway, he's holding the Amulet of Mark. Okay, I guess Mark is a normal name, but that's that's not the kind of Mark I'm talking about. Like, it, it, not the name Mark. It's not Mark's amulet. It's an amulet we can use to cast the spell Mark. With it, we can mark our current location and then recall back to it whenever we want. Think of it like fast travel, but you can only have it set to one place at a time, and it's way more inconvenient. That whole ordeal leveled up enough major and minor skills for me to get a character level. Let me show you how convoluted Morrowind's level system is. You can add points to three attributes per character level, and you get a character level after you get 10 levels across all your major and minor skills. Depending on which skills you level during the course of that character level determines how many attribute points you can allocate when you rest and get another character level. But you could also level up miscellaneous skills which don't affect your character level but do contribute to the total amount of attribute points you can allocate when you level up. This is why if you want to level efficiently, none of your major or minor skills should be ones you ever plan on using. You start off weaker, but it allows you to control exactly when you get a character level more easily, meaning you can guarantee every attribute you level up when you get a character level will get five more points. For my first level, I went to a trainer and trained in medium armor 10 times, so I'd be able to allocate five skill points to endurance. I do the same for other miscellaneous skills to get more agility, strength, or speed points, but I don't have enough money for it right now. The reason why I want to level up endurance is, as I said earlier, it affects how much health you get every level and it's not retroactive, so it's best to get as much endurance as you can earlier than later. But again, you don't have to be optimal. Enemies don't scale, so you're not going to get to level 20 wrongly and be surrounded by equal leveled but too strong enemies. Optimizing just makes the early game a bit more smooth, and it can kind of make you feel like a god after a while. You can really break this game using totally intended mechanics. Not, I'm not even talking about exploiting like weird bugs and glitches that they, they didn't mean, but like actual intended mechanics. Things that they put in the game on purpose, but like just results they didn't foresee. It's really fun. It can, it can be bonkers. Probably the main reason why I recommend everybody play this game. Let's finally get on with the main quest. Back in Balmora, we head toward that Tim Burton looking monstrosity in the distance. See those towers? Without OpenMW and the two dozen graphics mods I have installed, you won't be able to see that. The future hides behind the fog of render distance. Our first real enemy, this dude on the bridge, Snowy Granius. Who is he? Why is he here? No clue, but he can definitely be tough if you're new to the game. If you aren't interested in pre-planning a character and for your first playthrough, maybe just go into it blind, I suggest exploring other places and maybe level up a bit, be more ready, should make things easier. We explore the Dwemer ruins in search of the puzzle box, killing a bunch of treasure hunters, I guess, on the way. You know, it's funny. Every time I play through this game, I forget that you don't actually need to enter the deeper parts of the ruin, but there is a place called Weeping Bell Hall. It might be a Pokemon reference. I don't think it's a coincidence, and you'll understand why later. The puzzle box is on the second level when you come in. You just climb the rocks and enter the door, kill boss Crito if you want, and pick up the little box right here. Super easy to miss. I do it all the time. Now that we have the box, we can just recall back to Balmora. Ain't that handy. We'll need to return to Caius a lot for the next few quests, so I'm going to place my mark in his house before I bring the cube to Fat Ass. Or, what was his name? As Fat? Oh. Here's the cube, sir. In exchange, he gives us notes about the lost sixth house, House Dagoth, which we promptly bring to Grandpa No Shirt. Our next task is to see what Sharn Grab Muzgob knows of the Nerevarine. Are you surprised that she's an orc with a name like that? In exchange for info, we gotta go grave robbing. Gotta steal a skull from the Andrano Ancestral Tomb. Dunmer have some weird hang-ups about necromancy, death, and murder, or maybe the opposite of hang-ups, I, I don't know. I have no idea if what I'm doing is wrong, or if I'm just assimilating to the local culture. Whatevs. This is actually a rather dangerous quest, for the uninitiated. First of all, certain enemies can't be damaged with regular weapons. You need to use enchanted or silver weapons for, say, ghosts. Daedric weapons work too, 
but you're probably unlikely to have one at this point. Thankfully, you can buy silver arrows in Balmora. The second danger is the Bone Boys. These Bone Walkers aren't just strong, but they can place a curse on you, reducing your strength. Every point of strength is 5 carry weight, so it doesn't take much to leave you over encumbered. What's exceptionally dangerous is that this debuff doesn't just go away on its own. You need a potion of cure disease if it's brown rot, a restore strength potion, or you need to pray at a shrine. If you don't have the supplies and your strength is drained to zero, you're stuck. Reloading is your only real option. With marksmanship, even in tight quarters, you can stay away from the bone walkers easily enough but set up a safety save just in case. Here's the skull, let's scoop that up and bring it back to Sharn. She gives us notes on the Nerevarine cult and tells us that Nerevar is a first age hero who united the Dunra houses against foreign invaders and died in battle. This is, of course, not the full story. Grandpa is pleased with our success and promotes us to the apprentice rank of the Blades. Yeah, we're part of the Blades. But he won't give us our next orders. We're not at the level of performance that he's looking for. We gotta be level 3. Two acrobatics levels should do it, and it'll increase the amount of strength points we can allocate. The easiest way to level acrobatics is to just jump wherever you go. That's why I turned off footstep sounds, because it gets a bit annoying after a while. The second easiest way is to spam jump as you walk up a slope because you hit the ground sooner than you would if you were jumping on flat ground. Jumping from high heights and taking damage on the landing also levels up acrobatics. I like leveling up acrobatics at the Aldrin Silt Strider because you can hop up the ramp really really fast and then jump off and take some damage, then hop up the ramp really really fast again, then jump off and take some damage. It's pretty good. Our next orders are to head to Vivac the city and speak with Adhiranir, a Khajiiti operative for the Thieves Guild, Hulia, a Morag Tong assassin, and Mara Milo, a temple priestess. Vivek City is massive, and it's easy to get lost in. I know it sounds like a butt is coming, but there isn't. You're gonna get lost. Hulia needs an escort to Jobasha's bookstore, but three Dunmar racists don't take too kindly to Argonians, probably due to the whole Argonian being slaves thing, but a few hours does the job. At the bookstore, Hulia tells us, to understand the Nerevarine cult, we must understand the history of the Ashlanders. The Nerevarine cult is at the heart of the conflict between the nomadic Ashlanders and the Great Houses. While I'm here, I'll buy a copy of The Progress of Truth. We're gonna need that later. Adhiranir is in the St. Olm's sewers. I always forget which side she's on, and today is no different. Oh, there's throwing weapons in this game too. They scale the same way as bows and crossbows, but the ammunition is the weapon. They're, um, they're not very good. Now let me drop this present tense post-commentary shtick for a second. This NPC right here, I knew she was aggressive, but I wasn't sure if her aggression was triggered specifically by a Daedric Prince questline, so I approached her without attacking first. She wasn't attacking, so I thought maybe I could talk to her. <laughs> then she yells at me and I legitimately got scared. I wasn't hamming it up or anything. It was really funny. But here and here is hanging out on this side of the sewers. She won't tell us what we need to know unless I get the tax man off her back. We just need to go upstairs and tell him that Adhiranir left for the mainland and he takes our word for it. She tells us that the sixth house is smuggling something and they pay well. What they're smuggling is a mystery. Mara Milo is a priestess in the temple district and she tells us she knows nothing about the sixth house, but she can tell us about the Nerevarine cult. The temple worships Nerevar as a saint and hero, but prophecies of his reincarnation are considered heresy. She tells us to get a copy of The Progress of Truth for Caius Cossades, good thing I already bought one, because it outlines the beliefs of the dissident priests a group of adherents that disputes temple doctrine regarding the prophecy. Back at Old Flesh Leaves, we're told we need an Ashlander informant, and there's conveniently one in Aldrin who left his tribe to become a traitor. As is Ashlander tradition, we have to give Hasor Zane Subabi a gift as a sign of courtesy. He likes poetry, so a copy of Words of Wind should do it. There's even a bookstore in Aldrin, like this game was designed or something. Hasor accepts the gift and gives us notes on Ashlanders and the Nerevarine cult. Everybody gives us notes. We learn that a guiding passion of the cult is the hatred of foreigners. Doesn't bode too well for us. The heads of the cult, Nibani Mesa and Sulmatul, more of these ridiculous names, are at the Urshalaku camp, oh my god, in northern Vardenfell, and that's where Caius wants us to go. The closest taxi service we can get to the camp is the city of Kul, traveling there by Siltstrider. We gotta walk the rest of the way. Man, can a guy just go for a stroll in the ashy wastelands of Vardenfell without being assaulted by bandits, I guess? You don't even have any good loot. Jesus Christ, does this place have any normal animals? Even even the even the rats are the size of raccoons. As soon as you step foot in water, you get swarmed by slaughterfish. They might as well be immortal, because my arrows and bolts can't touch them. Damn it. Shit. Damn it. Stop. <laughs> this camp just sounds like a dude. And we're here at the camp. This place shall be my new mark location since we'll be coming back here more than a few times. And getting back to Balmora is pretty easy with intervention scrolls and silk shrouders. For the Ashkan of the Urshalaku tribe to speak with us, an outlander, we must present his Gulakan with a gift that exalts their culture and their people. 200 bucks. You'll come to learn in Morrowind, charisma and coin are two sides of the same... 
coin. Sumatul tells us in order to be adopted into the tribe, we must prove our worth by fetching Sul Senapul's Bonebiter bow from the Urshalaku burial caverns. I, I swear I'm speaking a different language. What is it, peasant? Oh, you're very pretty. Surprisingly so, for a game from 2002. Anyway, let's level up before we leave. This cave is full of bastard skellies, but that's fine since it's impossible to take skeletons seriously anyway. They all sound like Skeletor to me. At the end of the dungeon is a spooky ghost that we kill with a few well-placed enchanted arrows that I picked up from some of the skellies throughout the dungeon. The bow is on the ghost's corpse. We recall back to the Urshalaku camp, becoming a clan friend, and are awarded with the bow itself. The enchantment on it isn't great, but if I ever run out of silver arrows, I can use this bow to kill ghosts and Daedra with any other arrow type. The camp's wise woman, Nibani Mesa, gives us two books which cryptically outline the Nerevarine prophecy, the seven trials the Nerevarine must undergo. It's not clear what each trial means, but being named Nerevarine by the four tribes and becoming Hortator of the three great houses is pretty specific. That'll come up soon enough. First, we need to return to Caius for more orders. While he has his informants working on deciphering the meaning of the prophecy, he sends us to Fort Buckmoth to gather more information about the Imperial Patrol that was attacked by Sixth House agents. Race Apulia tells us the only survivor of the attack was afflicted with the corpus disease, and before he died, making him no longer a survivor, he mentioned a cavern called Ilunibi. That's where we're headed. These goddamn fish! Caverns are pretty dark. Didn't seem this dark when I was playing, but I guess they recorded darker or something. I'll, I'll see if I could brighten them up. So this is our first introduction to the sixth house enemy types. These ones, Ash Slaves, are my least favorite. I think the purple shield increases their evasion or something because I whiff with my arrows way more when the bubble is up. Dark Brotherhood, how, why are you here? Oh, a level. Neat. Five to strength and speed, three to agility. Not bad. Marowak Spine. Understand why I think Weeping Bell Hall was a Pokemon reference, because this has to be a Pokemon reference. They get a Jimmy Carter look to them, don't they? After traversing this maze of a cavern, I finally reach the leader of this little coven of ash monsters, Dagoth Gares, priest of the Illinibi Shrine. He passes on a message from Dagoth Ur to us, bidding that we come to Red Mountain to confront him. Perhaps we will. Perhaps we will. We will. Don't be fooled. Ash ghouls may look like plague doctors, but that snoot is a fleshy growth coming out of their hollowed out skull. As Garis dies, he places a curse upon us. Even as my master wills, you shall come to him in his flesh and of his flesh. Ominous, but helpful. You'll see why soon. There's some decent loot at the shrine, not to use, but to sell. There's also a vendor in the game with 5,000 gold who buys things at the tooltip value, so we're going to be making frequent trips to him soon. But we got a mission to report back on. Grandpa is glad that we dealt with the Six House Shrine, but he's worried about my corpus. Devaith Fear, a Talvani wizard, runs a corpusarium where victims may live out their lives, minds addled by the disease. He may know of a cure. God, I'd love to fight you, dude, but in your present condition, being underwater makes things impossible for me. You know, these guys once ruled Tamriel during a different Kalpa. Tel Fear in northeastern Vardenfell is home to Devaith Fear and his cadre of daughter wives. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, so he cloned them from himself, basically. So he created his wives. So they aren't actually his daughters, but it's still weird. And he refers to them as his daughters. So that's even creepier. Tavani wizards aren't very concerned with optics. Fear says he'll give us a corpus cure, which has been nothing but deadly to the other test subjects. But he wants us to look around the corpusarium first to see what's in store for us if we don't take his cure. I guess death is preferable to what we're going to see. While we're there, he wants us to chat with his oldest patient, Yegrim Bagarn, and bring back the pair of boots he's been fixing. The warden of the corpusarium says some words, probably use words, words not worth paying attention to. Why heed his words? His words are just words. I get the drop on the lame corpus and take it out, and then I realize they're all non-aggressive. Monstrous, but peaceful. Oops, I hope that's not a problem. Yegrim Bagarn is the last Dwemer on Tamriel, as far as we know, and he's a bloated mutant due to the divine disease, but he's still got his wits about him somehow. He gives us the boots, and we return to Devaith Fear, who is rightfully pissed that we killed an inmate. So I'm screwed. He won't talk to me. And I don't have a save that wouldn't undo hours worth of work. Shit. Not something you see in uh, new games, huh? Pretty drastic consequences. But there is still hope. With enough personality, he'll forgive me. But how do we get a better personality? Self-improvement? Nah. My first thought was magic. I can make a fortified personality spell 100 points for one second. The world pauses in dialogue, so that buff would persist while speaking to him. But the cast chance is low, and using magic spells, even though it's not in combat, feels against the spirit of the challenge, even though I'm using other skills as well. But I don't know, I didn't want to do it. It might not even be enough anyway. There is another option, Telvani Bug Musk. It boosts personality by 40 for 60 seconds, and the boost stacks. Five doses of bug musk, 200 points of personality. Cien Sintiev in Aldrun sells a few. Here's hoping that forum post from 15 years ago wasn't lying. 70, 110, 150, 190, 230 personality. Oh, thank God. Forgiveness from Devaith Fear the Great. Oof. 
Good. He takes the boots and pours the potion down her throat. As he expected, it doesn't cure the disease, but it removes any and all symptoms while retaining its two benefits, immunity to disease and immunity to aging, fulfilling the second trial of the prophecy. Neither blight nor age can harm him, the curse of flesh before him flies. Back to Caius. He informs us that he's been recalled to the Imperial City. We'll be on our own from now on. His last order is to meet with Maramila once again and find the lost prophecies. When we return to the Vivek Temple District, Mara is nowhere to be found, but by picking the lock on the door to her quarters, within we find a letter to Amaya, the code word Caius told us about. The letter reveals that she had to run some old documents over to the Inquisitor at the Ministry of Truth, and that she's likely to be tied up there for a while. Sounds fishy. She writes to bring two divine intervention scrolls with us and that we're free to use the levitate potion she left behind. The Ministry of Truth is within the rock floating above the temple. That's actually a meteor, Bardao, sent by Shea Gorath, or perhaps sent by its own malevolence, to crush the city of Vivek, but Vivek, the god, froze it in place protecting Vardenfell, and he's also kind of keeping his finger on the nuclear button. He could let it fall at any moment should his people stop loving him. He's kind of evil. Alvela Saram, the guard outside the Ministry of Truth, is sympathetic to our cause, and she gives us a key to enter, but demands we spill no ordinator blood. Within the left side of the ministry are a few ordinators. By sneaking, we can swipe a key from the desk and leave unnoticed. On the other side of Bardao is a maze of tunnels. If I use an invisibility potion, I should be able to... Oops, spotted. Screw it, run through the door. Oh shit, that's a, uh, that's a lot I got. Uh, run and dodge. What's your story? Bit busy, friend. The cells are locked, need a key. Where's the key? Ah, desk. Give me the key. Uh, uh, uh. You're finished. You're finished. They're right behind me, aren't they? Whoa, 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 can't touch me. Ooh. Dice rolls, bless me. Excuse me, humming Nord, best of luck. Enter the cell, Mara. I, I, great to see you. Take this scroll, and let's get out of here. Meet Blada Hateria? Blada Hateria? In Ebonheart? Dope. Holomayan? Gotcha. Come on. Blada? Excellent. Take me to Holomayan, please. So, I'm told a portal will open up, but only at dawn or dusk. This isn't a portal. This this is just a door. Gilvis Borello, head of the dissident priests, scoured the libraries and found a ton of books to give us. Nibani may be able to interpret these works better than us, so we return to her and tell her what we've found. She tells us we've already completed the first two trials, born on a certain day to uncertain parents, and conquering Corpus. The third trial is known to Sul Matul, but before he tells us, he asks us to go to Kogarun, one of the many halls home to House Dagoth. There, he wants us to collect Corpus Weepings, a House Dagoth cup, and the Shadow Shield from the tomb of Dagoth Morin deep within Kogarun. Before entering the Den of Demons, I want to pop over to Caldera and make some sales. Creeper is a kind of hidden vendor. He has a maximum of 5,000 gold, which replenishes every 24 hours, and he buys items for their full value. There's a way to sell items many times greater than the gold he has by buying back items you've already sold to him. If you want to sell an item for 10k, you can sell it while buying 5k worth of stuff. Wait an in-game day and then sell the stuff you bought back to him, getting your full 10k. There are a lot of valuables here in Kagarun, and we're going to have to do the creeper shuffle to get the most out of them. Oh, there are corpus weepings right here on the floor. That's convenient. Along with the potential valuables we could find here, there are also plenty of powerful enemies like these squid face monsters. They look like something out of Apocrypha, but Hermaeus Mora ain't involved here. At least I don't think so. It's a good thing this room has a convenient pillar in the middle of it. Deeper in Kagarun are fire atronacs and they are deadly. The fireballs themselves are easy to dodge, but they come with a large area of effect that does a lot of damage. They're dangerous as well, so silver and enchanted weapons only. Locked doors, what secrets do you hide? Corpses. Oh, an ebony short sword, worth 10k. Oh, and glass armor on this dead guy. And a long blade worth 3.2k. Nice. The glass armor is better than what I have right now, so I'll be keeping that. Oh, but there is a glass halberd on the wall. I could sell that for 16k. Another locked door. Oh, sewers. With frost atronax. Quite the change of environment. And a hole in the wall changes the vibe again. Oh, well here's the shield. But where's that cup? Down this way? Whoa, whoa, whoa what is that? Okay, skeletons can be scary. Ash vampire. What the heck? Oh, let's just get through this door. How... How did I get here? Let's regroup and sell off some of this loot. The Creeper Shuffle left me with over 46,000 gold. Excellent. Yeah, so I'm back at Kagarun, and the cup is in the room where we killed that squid face guy. Super obvious. Sulmatul is pleased with our success and lets us keep the crap we got. The shield could prove useful, but not as a shield. It has an enchant on it that when we cast it, we can turn invisible. He also awards us with Malipu Ataman's belt. It has an on-cast effect that buffs agility for a little bit. It's alright. The third trial is another riddle, but it's simple if you already know where to go. On the eastern half of Vardenfell is the cavern of the Incarnate. 
door is locked. At dawn or dusk, we can enter and claim the Ring of Moon and Star, fortifying personality and speechcraft. Azura tells us to be named Nerevereen by the four Ashlander tribes and become Hortator of the Three Great Houses. Before we leave, there's a bunch of ghosts in here that'll give us stuff. The travel-stained pants, gross, are the most useful because they have an on-cast levitate effect. Paths are ambiguous in Morrowind. Sometimes it helps to just go over the mountains instead of navigating around them. Everything else is either a weapon we can't use or a boring on-cast item, so they're not worth mentioning. On to the tribes. We already helped out the Urshalaku, or so I thought, that's foreshadowing. So we have three more to do. The Zainab tribe. The Ashkan Kaushad wants us to deal with a vampire that's taken refuge in the nearby Narano ancestral tomb. Should be easy enough. Holy shit, he's fast. Okay, after several deaths, I got to a point where he has no magical left and is just punching me, but I have no stamina, so his punches are knocking me over. Really wish I had fire arrows. Vampires are very weak to fire. Oh, I got, <laughs> I got a light armor level. There we go. Man, vampires suck. Yes, Kaushad, Calvario's dead. Can I be Nerevarine now? You want a wife. A highborn Telvani bride. Really? Alright, so the Zainab wise woman told us to buy a slave instead because no highborn Telvani would ever agree to marrying an Ashlander. We can buy a slave in Telerun. We just, uh, whoa. My What, what did I just walk into? Seville Main will sell us a slave, and to make her look like a noble, we need to dress her in expensive clothing and give her a Telvani bug musk. Hey, personality. After making several trips back and forth from Teleron buying the stuff that I needed to buy to give to the slave, I finally buy the slave for 1200 coins, give her the clothing and the perfume, and must now escort her all the way back to the camp. Can't just use recall, we gotta walk. Well, at least Falora Luravu. Wow, that name is... It sounds- it, you can't say that without sounding drunk. Falora Lorvu. At least she seems okay with the deal. I suppose being married to an Ashkan is better than being a slave, although there are implications I don't really like about this arrangement. <sighs> anyway, Zainab Nerevereen, in the bag, and Kaushad gives us a thong. Okay. Next up, Arabinimson. 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 Yeah. They hate anyone not part of their tribe because no one can pronounce it. And there are two factions within the tribe, war-loving and peace-loving. The wise woman is peace-loving, so obviously she wants us to kill the war-loving Ashkan and his Gulakans. I, of course, am willing to oblige because whatever. They're not too tough. After killing them, I need to loot their magical items and give them to Hanamu. The collection of trinkets gives him the fortitude to take up the title of Ashkan, and he names us Nerevereen of the uh, Rabben tribe. I did get to keep some of the items, though. There's a right Bone Dancer gauntlet that gives a constant plus five bonus to agility. The other gauntlet, the left one, provides 10 points of shield. A pretty good buff, but it leaves a particle effect thing on the screen and it's annoying, so I'm not gonna use it. The final tribe is the Ahimusa. They need a new place to live, somewhere safe, and ask that I clear out the ruins on an island to the north. Ald Daedroth is a Daedric ruins devoted to Shagorath, so there's bound to be some nasties within. At the ruins are agents of the temple here to root out Daedra worship and other heretical actions against the tribunal. If we tell them we're here to loot the place, they'll leave us alone, unless we attack them. In the temple are Shagorath worshippers who put up a prolonged fight. The higher my level gets, the easier it is to bob and weave between attacks, and circular rooms are perfect for kiting enemies, but it gets kind of silly after a while. The ringleader in all this is Hloreni Indavel. She's a bit bonkers, but such is the nature of Shagorth worshippers. As I've said, gold is the ultimate persuader. We get her disposition high enough and plead the pitiful case of the Ahmusa, and she's moved. None of her followers will bring any harm to the Ashlanders. Easy. The hard part comes next, escorting the wise woman to the ruins. Where are you going? Help! A beast! Help! A beast! Get away, beast! What? What is happening? Get away, beast! Okay, so after about a half an hour, I finally got her here, and she's happy. I'm glad the ordinators aren't a problem. She names us Nerevereen of the Ahimusa onto the Great Houses. But first, Creeper Shovel. Got some good loot in Aldadroth, and I have over 160k now. Gold means nothing anymore. House Hlalu. Crassius Curio, who wants us to call him Uncle, uh, he'll vote to make us Hortator on one condition. We give him a thousand gold. Easy. But I still have to convince the other counselors as well. Ingling Half Troll is easy enough. His vote costs 2k. Drembero is hiding in the haunted house atop the St. Olm's Canton. Finding him proves our resourcefulness, so we have his vote. Or if it's Dren, 
Ren doesn't care about prophecies, but with a couple thousand gold worth of bribes, he's more than willing to entertain the notion. He's spoken with Dagoth Ur, actually, but he has no qualms with playing both sides. All he wants is to drive the Empire out of Morrowind. With him convinced, I only have to speak to the final two counselors and confirm their support because they're in Dren's pocket. Becoming Halu Hortator earns me a belt with a constant Fortify Magica effect, useless for me. Before moving on to the next two houses, I want to get a better weapon. I've been using this steel longbow since the beginning, and I really feel like I should have gotten something better by now. I hope to stumble upon something, but I never did. Instead, I'm going to go out of my way and grab a guaranteed bow spawn. In the Daedric ruins of Malkashishi, what? Mal Malkashishi? This freaking game. High at the top, most easily accessible with a levitate spell, or pants that can levitate, is a skeleton sitting on top of a Daedric bow surrounded by eight Daedric arrows. I should have gotten this much sooner. I didn't even need to kill anything to get this. I mean, I did kill some stuff in the dungeon. I just didn't have to. This bow not only deals twice as much damage as the steel bow, but any arrow fired from it will be able to hurt Daedra and ghosts. No more arrow swapping. Onward to House Redoran. In Aldrin, within the corpse of a giant mud crab, are the estates of the Redoran counselors. Athan Sarethi will vote for us if we rescue his son from the Venom Manor, but we can't kill both in Venom. There are various ways of going about this, but my method was the simplest. Run in, find the guy behind a curtain covered door, get him to follow you, sprint for the exit. He'll follow you through doors, but the Venom folk, who are mad at you, won't. Once his son is back home, Athan Sarethi promises to use his influence with the other counselors to make me Hortator, but Bolvin Venom has the power to veto their votes. After running to each counselor and locking in their support, Bolvin agrees to duel me in the Vivek Arena. Die, 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 Ooh, he's a feisty one. And now he's a dead one. Local customs frown upon looting the dead after an honorable duel. Normally, I would loot his really expensive gear, but I don't need the gold and his armor is too heavy anyway, so pretend I'm respecting the culture. I return to Sarethi and am named Hortator of House Redoran. The Telvani counselors are spread across Vardenfell, but fortunately, they're all in places with taxi access, either by boat or silt strider. Arion is willing to vote for me, but he informs us that the other counselors may not be so easy to convince. Neloth is ill-tempered, and yes, that is the same Neloth from the Dragonborn deal, Dratha hates men, Therana is nuts, and Gothrin is flaky and non-committal. We're just gonna have to kill him. Therana will talk forever, but if you throw enough money at her, she's willing to vote for us. Neloth is the same. A few thousand coins is all it takes. Dratha hates men, but she doesn't hate the money of men. Get her disposition high enough, and she'll be amused if you grovel at her feet, and we'll vote for you to be Hortador. Female characters might have an easier time with this. Finally, Gothrin. Murder for social standing is the Tavani way. If you get murdered, well, it's because you weren't very good at being unmurderable. So killing him is just a-okay. He kept healing, though. With that, we've completed the first five trials. Or so I thought. At a certain point in the quest line, you get a correspondence telling you to meet with temple officials in Vivek once you become Hortator of all three houses and are named Nerevarine by the Ashlanders. But Danso and Dulez is telling me to go away until I complete those tasks. As it happens, even after doing all that stuff for the Urshalaku tribe, you still need to formally request that they name you Nerevarine. So I hoof it all the way back to their camp in the north, chat with Sul Matul, get teeth of the Urshalaku as a gift, I, what? And am finally ready to move on to the next part of the quest, the final act. Tholar Saryani meets with us in secret, handing us a secret palace entrance key. With this key, we may have an audience with one of Morrowind's living gods, Vivek. Vivek outlines a plan we ought to take to defeat Dagoth Ur, but we won't be doing all of it. The only required parts of the plan is getting the two artifacts Sunder and Keening before confronting Dagoth Ur himself. The other Ash vampires he wants us to kill, they don't matter. He also gives us Wraithguard, a gauntlet we must wear if we want to wield Sunder or Keening without taking heavy damage. Now I know what you're thinking. Sunder is a hammer, Keening is a short blade. Those aren't bows. And you're right, if I have to use them, then that means it's not possible to beat Morrowind with only marksmanship. And you do have to use them to defeat Dagoth Ur. So this run was dead from the beginning, technically. Spiritually, the run still lives. Maybe clickbait? Put a big no in the thumbnail? I don't know, I'll think about it. Here's the beauty of Levitate. Just pop right over the ghost gate and soar above the mountains to the Ash Vampire Citadel, Veminal. The place is, unsurprisingly, full of ash monsters, but our primary target is the Ash Vampire near the end of the dungeon. I actually just ran by a bunch of the enemies because most of them aren't huge threats. 
The worst are the Ash Slaves, but they don't seem to tell you for very long. The first Ash Vampire, Dagoth Vemin, is pretty easy. He has some spells, but he mostly tries to smack me with his claws. I'm too fast and I just keep staggering him with arrows. He drops Sunder. The other Ash Vampire Citadel, Odrasal, is pretty easy to traverse as well. There's a Golden Saint here, but those are trivial with a Daedric Bow. Dagoth Odros is the same as Vemin. Kite him while poking him with arrows. Beware of that Fire Atronach upstairs though. That can... he can take you by surprise. Odros drops a key which I use to unlock access to a shrine with Keening at its center. With both of Kagranak's tools in hand, it's time to put an end to Dagoth Ur. His citadel is deep within Red Mountain, the entrance only accessible by pulling this super hard to see lever. I was actually here for about 10 minutes looking for this thing. This lair is full of strong enemies, including squid face guys. Rather than fighting my way in, I just bunny hopped through the halls, totally not dying after taking a wrong turn several times, and made it to the final arena, going into a new zone where enemies can't follow. I do all this while Dagoth Ur is taunting me, his voice lines triggering probably sooner than even he expected them to. Oh, and it's funny, he gets mad if I use invisibility. Is this how you honor the sixth house and the tribe unmourned? Come to me openly and not by stealth. He has a speech and all, and you can chat with him because you are, after all, the reincarnation of someone who was once his dear friend, but all the chat options lead to the same place, combat. It's time to use those Daedric arrows. Six arrows is all it took to put him down, but in the next room... What a fool you are. I'm a god. How can you kill a god? What a grand and intoxicating innocence. How could you be so naive? There is no escape. No recall or intervention can work in this place. What are you no. doing? Lay down Come your back, weapons. Stop. This it's is not the end. too late for my mercy. The bitter, bitter end. Oof. Oops. Alright, so we need to hit the Heart of Lorcan once with Sunder and five times with Keening to unmake the divine threads that bind the heart's power to Nern, or some such. Tonal magic is weird, just smash the heart and poke it, until you win. Can you put it full stop? This is the end. The bitter, bitter end. Once the heart's destroyed, you can permanently kill Dagoth Ur. Or the bridge can collapse. That works. On the way out, we're met with Azura, her <laughs> little pog jab. So, can you beat Morrowind using only marksmanship in combat? Technically, no. But the rest of the game? I mean, yeah, totally doable. In fact, it ended up being pretty strong in the end. I had fun. 